What comes to your mind when you think about the 80s? Big hair, Walkmans, wild parties, neon lights, and MTV, right? But amid all that cool stuff, there was some serious news hitting the headlines. And now the ozone layer. Our ozone layer was in trouble. Scientists made a chilling discovery. A giant hole in the ozone layer right over Antarctica. Turns out, we were the bad guys with our chemicals eating away at the ozone. Not just over the South Pole, but globally. It was all over the news. This stuff even made it into movies. Imagine, without an ozone layer, we'd face total ecological collapse, skyrocketing skin cancer rates, and, well, life as we know it could have ended. Fast forward to today, and guess what? The ozone layer is healing. It's like the whole world came together in this amazing effort to dodge a global disaster. Makes you wonder, how did we pull that off? And the big question, can we pull off something like that again with climate change? The narrative surrounding the ozone layer, once a prominent environmental issue, has largely receded from the public eye. But what happened to the ozone hole since it was discovered more than three decades ago? Ozone is predominantly located in the stratosphere, a critical layer of the atmosphere situated between 10 and 50 kilometers above Earth's surface. This ozone layer serves as an invisible protective barrier, absorbing two types of harmful UV radiation from the sun. Without this protection, life on Earth would face severe risks. The initial monitoring of ozone concentrations above Antarctica began in the 1950s, conducted by the British Antarctic Survey. It was several decades, however, before the magnitude of the issue was recognized. In 1974, scientists Mario Molina and F. Sherry Rowland published a pivotal paper suggesting that chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, commonly used in refrigerants and aerosol propellants, were depleting the ozone in the stratosphere. This groundbreaking theory sparked significant international response and set the stage for subsequent environmental regulations. Until that point, CFCs were considered harmless. However, Molina and Rowland challenged this perception suggesting that these chemicals were, in fact, damaging the ozone layer. Despite their groundbreaking findings, the industry pushed back hard, claiming their products were safe. As a result, the use of CFCs continued to grow throughout the 1970s. These chemicals became common across the globe, found in refrigerators, air conditioners, aerosol sprays, and as solvents in industrial cleaning. A mere decade later, in 1985, the British Antarctic Survey provided conclusive evidence of a hole in the ozone layer, affirming a direct connection to CFCs. This discovery ultimately vindicated Molina and Rowland's earlier work, leading to their recognition with the 1995 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Their research not only reshaped global policies on chemical use, but also highlighted the impact of human activities on the environment. The following year, as the Antarctic winter was drawing to a close, Susan Solomon, a researcher at the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, led a scientific expedition to McMurdo Base to delve deeper into the ozone depletion mystery. Her team launched balloons to gather ozone measurements from the sky, while others conducted parallel measurements on the ground. At the time, the scientific community was considering three possible theories to explain the phenomenon, one of which was proposed by Dr. Solomon herself. She hypothesized that the key might lie in the surface chemistry involving chlorine found on polar stratospheric clouds, clouds that only form at high altitudes during the frigid polar winter. The breakthrough came when they identified chlorine, derived from man-made chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, as the primary culprit. On Earth's surface, CFCs are inert, but once they ascend into the stratosphere, ultraviolet light from the sun breaks them down, releasing chlorine. The persistence of CFCs, which can linger in the atmosphere for 50 to 150 years, compounded the issue. Given the widespread use of CFCs at the time, 
The implications of this discovery were profound, pointing directly to human activities as the source of this global environmental crisis. Then, in 1987, the Montreal Protocol was established, setting forth a global agreement to phase out chemicals that deplete the ozone layer. Throughout the 1990s and into the early 2000s, this treaty effectively brought the production and consumption of CFCs to a standstill. By 2009, an impressive 98% of the chemicals listed in the agreement had been eliminated. The protocol also includes provision for amendments, which have been utilized six times to tighten restrictions based on new scientific findings. These amendments have targeted not only CFCs, but also their replacements, such as hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs, and hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, which, while less harmful to the ozone layer, pose new challenges due to their significant global warming potential. For example, the most widely used HCFC has a global warming potential nearly 2,000 times greater than that of carbon dioxide highlighting the complex balance between protecting the ozone layer and addressing climate change impacts. Ultimately, every country in the world signed the Montreal Protocol, making it the only treaty ever to be universally ratified. It was initially aimed at protecting the ozone layer, but also delivered substantial climate benefits. In 2010 alone, the emission reductions achieved through the protocol were estimated to be between 9.7 and 12.5 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. This figure significantly surpasses the reductions targeted by the Kyoto Protocol, another international treaty established in 1997 to curb greenhouse gases, which aimed for reductions five to six times less than those achieved by the Montreal Protocol. In 2016, the Kigali Amendment was adopted under the Montreal Protocol to further limit the use of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, which are potent greenhouse gases. This amendment is projected to prevent up to 0.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by the year 2100, marking another significant step in international environmental policy. This achievement underscores its status as the most successful environmental agreement in history, demonstrating a rare unity among nations toward a common environmental cause. It's been over 30 years since the Montreal Protocol was signed, and the good news is that the ozone hole has stopped getting bigger and is actually starting to shrink. By 2065, experts expect it to be completely healed, but there's still more to be done. When people talk about the success of the Montreal Protocol, they often compare it to tackling climate change. While the protocol proves we can handle big environmental issues, it's not quite the same. CFCs, the chemicals harming the ozone, were only used in a few products, so replacing them was pretty manageable. Climate change, on the other hand, involves dealing with fossil fuels, which are a huge part of how we live. Unlike CFCs, fossil fuels aren't so easy to replace, and reducing their use has been a lot tougher, with many governments and industries slow to cut back on emissions. This is a big win for our planet, and it shows that when we come together for our home, we can make a difference. I hope one day to see a video like this explaining why we no longer hear about climate change.